Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This is S4A live stream number 47 being recorded on September 24, 2022. I'm joined in the chat on Twitch, twitch.tv slash socialism S4A by about two dozen comrades and we've been chatting a little bit for a few minutes, but it's time to start the show. So this is the fourth stream in four days. I don't usually do this, but actually it hasn't been that bad. Uh, there's been a lot that I've wanted to cover, a lot of it I've uh, been pushing off. And so this stream, I'm not going to, um, well, we're going to get right to it, I guess is the point. Um, and we'll be checking in with the chat about halfway through and then again at the end. But I really want to make sure that we've been putting COVID stuff off for three days and some other things. So like I said, we're going to jump right into it. Uh, first off, we have some breaking news about COVID which is that the CDC is no longer requiring masking in all hospitals and nursing homes, which is on top of everything else, jaw dropping. I still have not completely reacted to this news. We're gonna read an article about it before we start anything else though. Then we're gonna do some housekeeping that I have been announcing and promising for the last few streams. We're gonna actually do it today. Uh, some follow up on the Iran uh, protest situation. Also, there, there was a teachable moment on Twitter about that that we're going to discuss as far as, um, you know, shallow um, PR support for human rights struggles by the CIA. What does this mean for socialists? What should be our stance when the CIA uh, says that they support something? Does it mean that we automatically stop supporting human rights struggles? No, obviously not. Otherwise, we'd be turning our backs on Black Lives Matter or LGBTQ plus struggles or anything else that they nominally will support. In the you know to lobby for more imperialism, which is just what they do. They're going to lobby for more imperialism, whether there's human rights struggles or not. Um, but you know we can't we a uh, have to support human rights struggles and b also have to impose imperialism. And we can do those things at the same time. In fact, if you can't do those things at the same time, you're not a very good communist. Uh, second, there was a point about uh, U.S. military demographics. Somebody raised. I just wanted to follow up on that briefly because it was interesting. And uh, a couple other things, statement on the Ukraine war. The main thing we're gonna do in this stream is make sure that we get to all the COVID stuff that I wanted to cover, including uh, the neurological harm. I mean, we've covered that before, but there's new studies on it. And uh, some other things relating to that and the emerging situation where BF, uh, excuse me, BA5 is still dominant, but BF7, which is a BA5 spinoff, and BA 4.6 and BA 2.75 are all converging. They look like the three of them are gonna overtake BA 5. This is a horrendous situation as we head into fall and closed windows and stagnant air and no masking, even in hospitals. This is a terrible situation, we're, we're gonna discuss that. Um, finally, if there's time, we'll read through that debate on worker ownership uh, that I was talking about the other day. And finally, if there's more time, we'll talk about United Front versus Popular Front and some of the CPUSA stuff. Um, again, you know, I know most of you out there who are rank and file in CPUSA, you're actual MLs and, you know, radical people with a good perspective. I know most of you agree with most of these pointing out the obvious. It's not even like detailed, you know, criticism. It's just sort of pointing out the obvious about some of the dem tailing and stuff like that. Um, We'll, we'll maybe follow up a little bit with that. There hasn't been a lot of pushback on that, to be honest. Just a few kind of more rad libby types have uh, given me a little bit of grief over that, though not as much as in the past when I have criticized CPUSA, which I maybe take on every six months or so, just kind of mention, hey, how's it coming over there? You guys stopped tailing the Dems yet? Uh, et cetera. All right. Let's get into, first of all, the sort of breaking news I saw late last night. This is about the CDC no longer requiring masking. Let's get the details because I don't even have all the details on this yet. So here's a story, CBS News. CDC says some nursing homes and hospitals no longer need to require universal masking. So keep in mind, back in 2020, nursing homes were one of the major sources of outbreaks of COVID and where a lot of the deaths were happening. And then, of course, like the schools, uh, that was spreading back into the communities. Schools, of course, more in 2021. Um, they were identified as a source of, you know, community spread. So anyway, outside of communities seeing, quote, high levels of COVID-19 transmission, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has ended a blanket plea 
for Americans in hospitals and nursing homes to wear masks indoors. Why would you do this? There is no point to doing this. We're in a sustained COVID surge. Now, unfortunately, Biobot, which is a great wastewater tracking site, has not been updated um, this week. I don't know what's going on. I, I asked them on Twitter what's going on. I have not heard back yet as far as I know. But this is about where we're at. There is um, This is one week behind their last update was September 14. If you go to biobot, B-I-O-B-O-T dot I-O slash data, D-A-T-A, -A, um, it's about the same. It, it's it's leveled off. Like you can see the uh, the wastewater curve ends on a sharp upward trend or at least you know 40 degree upward trend there. It's leveled out a bit, but it's still basically at that level. So we're in the longest sustained surge. It's as high as or higher than the Delta surge, uh, the surge of two winters ago and the initial surge. So, um, you know, this is this is a, a really serious strain. Obviously, we uh, we have the um, the vaccines now, which takes some of the edge off of the worst effects. But we have to stop spread. Otherwise, it's going to keep mutating. We could get a new, uh, you know, the way that Omicron was new last winter, we could get a new strain that is as as bad. Uh, what am I trying to say? Um, the ways in which Omicron was worse then and spread much more widely than the previous strain Delta did, we could get another quantum leap forward from the Omicron family that we're currently contending with and which despite all the vaccines, clearly is um, creating a huge amount of spread. Now, just because they're not counting the cases anymore, that's the little light blue line underneath the curve. The dark blue line is uh, coronavirus, genetic material discovered in the wastewater. That doesn't lie. That means that, you know, it's spreading and you can see that this has basically been matched. Uh, the curve has been matched to uh, where the wastewater curve and the cases curve, it's on a scale where they've, you know, pretty much uh, matched. But what happens last winter is the rapid tests come out and those rapid tests don't get reported. So they're no longer counting cases really. And how much are cases being underestimated? Well, the wastewater gives us some idea of that. Now, we've been in a, well, basically started in late March and then started to plateau in April and May. We've just had a sustained outbreak this entire time. There's absolutely nothing indicating that people should stop uh, masking at this point. So anyway, back to the story. Um, the change, one of many published Friday evening to the agency's guidance for COVID-19 infection control for healthcare workers, marks one of the final sets of revisions in a sweeping effort launched in August to overhaul the CDC's recommendations for the virus. Again, this isn't really based on anything other than a political desire, I would say, to launch the you know back to normal agenda, I guess intended to uh, get people to vote for the Democrats, although most people who are Democrat want more protections and things like that. So this is Biden pandering to the right uh, and using the lives of the vulnerable to basically as a bargaining chip there. Obviously, no consent was given for that. Uh, but th this is part of the back to normal agenda. It's not supported by any anything evidence based in terms of epidemiology. Since early in the pandemic, the agency had urged, quote, everyone to wear source control. What does that mean? Well, what's the source of the virus? Your body, you know, particularly your mouth and nose as you exhale or sneeze or stuff like that. Uh, so that's source control, masking, like well-fitting masks or respirators while in healthcare settings. By the way, if you're not wearing N95 masks, you need to start immediately, all the time. One exposure is all it takes for you to get it. And uh, what they're finding is people who get it four or five times, this is where it starts to, even in healthy people, uh, really start to crumble your health to the point where you can start to really die prematurely from it. And again, you got to separate out the acute phase, the first three weeks or so of, you know, that's where a lot of people get hospitalized or whatever, from the lingering effects. Whether it's long COVID, which seems to be a lot of the cases of long COVID are driven by a lingering low-grade infection, and that can cause all kinds of effects, or whether it's not specifically long COVID, but it's just organ damage that was done during the acute phase, and then your organs are just damaged and it takes a long time for them to heal. And then of course, certain kinds of tissue like nerve tissue 
really doesn't heal except under really extraordinary circumstances so you can't really expect that so yeah uh, you need to mask up the good news is uh, n95s are not hugely expensive you can usually find them in boxes of like 30 or 50 for about a dollar each if you go to somewhere like project n95 they sell them i have no affiliation i just you know there's other medical supply places that sell them as well I'm sure you can find them on amazon but i would make sure you're getting real n95 so if you do go to a project n95 um, those are niosh certified and and all that kind of stuff the kn95 is a chinese standard it's not that there's anything worse about the standard but there are apparently more counterfeit kn95s because it's not a u.s standard you don't get in trouble for selling counterfeit kn95s in the u.s the same way you would get in trouble for selling a counterfeit kn95 in china or a counterfeit n95 in the u.s if you see what i mean um so i, I would go towards the n95s myself but um you ne absolutely need to to start doing that but uh anyway now the cdc excuse me cdc says facilities in just over a quarter of counties can quote choose not to require all doctors patients and visitors great so you just brought in germs from mcdonald's the subway wherever the fuck you've been uh, and the people in the hospital are just stuck breathing that they can't go anywhere they're in a bed Anyway, quote, updates were made to reflect the high levels of vaccine and infection-induced immunity. Time out. All immunity to COVID is temporary and becoming even more temporary as the virus continues to mutate to be more immune evasive. It used to be, with the original strain of the, the virus that spread in 2020, if you got infected, you would have pretty robust immunity for like eight months, maybe 10 months. Now, you can get reinfected after a month, after a few weeks. So this is insanity. Um, that immunity is a last line of defense against reinfection, not a first line of defense, but that's how they're using it, is as a first line of defense. We need mask mandates. We need uh, tests to stay in schools. We need regular weekly testing in institutions, all that kind of stuff. And they're, they're throwing it away as we head into the danger time of year where windows are closed, People just generally are less, less healthy, more prone to death, to you know, inclined uh, to worse health outcomes in December, January, February. So th this is what they're doing. Um, so updates were made to reflect the high levels of fleeting and partial vaccine and infection-induced immunity and the availability of effective treatments and prevention tools, the CDC's new guidance says. Well, that's super interesting, considering that one, Paxlovid, as we've covered before, while useful for people over 65, seems to have no benefit for uh, people under 65, between like 40 and 65. So that's, uh, what, what, what is that? And then as far as the monoclonal antibodies, we haven't even really gotten into this in detail, but um, actually we did cover it in a previous stream where BA 2.75, which is now at about one and a half percent, I think, in the U.S. Um, actually, let's take a look. I have the uh, CDC regions dashboard here. This is from their Nowcast. If you go to the CDC COVID tracker, uh, you can see in the upper left, BA 5 is starting to wane, and BA 4.6, that's the blue one, is starting. Well, it's been gaining steadily week on week, about half a percentage point to one percentage point per week. Uh, BA 4.6 currently at about 12%, and then BA 2.75, 1.4%, and then the other one to watch for BF 7 is at 2.3%. That's growing uh, pretty quickly. That's uh, and then you can see it uh, where it is in the 10 regions of the United States, down at the bottom. But BA 2.75 does not respond to all of the approved monoclonal antibodies that were out at least in the spring. So they're gonna work on new monoclonal antibody therapies. That's basically what they do is, um, you know, when your body is confronted with an antigen, that's anything kind of it doesn't like or thinks shouldn't be there, such as a virus or a bacteria and, you know, other things. Um, it'll produce antibodies that can sort of handcuff the thing and cart it off to be disposed of by the rest of your immune system. Well, it's immune evasive uh, now where a lot of the antibodies that the body is producing 
it can't really grab onto the virus as easily. That, that's an issue. But anyway, the monoclonal antibodies where they take antibodies and then they clone them and then they have a you know bag of the stuff, like they have a supply of the stuff that they can then infuse into other people so that they're not relying just on their own antibodies. But the problem is these new variants are so immune evasive that uh, even the monoclonal antibodies are not nearly as effective against these strains as they were against the older strains. And it's not just a question of making new antibodies, it's a question of like finding an antibody that even can grab onto these things. So we're getting uh, closer and closer. Well, as far as the transmissibility now, the contagiousness of COVID, it's up around measles. It's about the most contagious virus that is known to humanity at this point. Then, as far as the immune escape, it's approaching SARS-1. SARS-1 had about a 15% mortality rate. Even if uh, SARS-2, COVID, got a 5% mortality rate, that's the percentage of people dying, we would be in just a world of shit. It would be unimaginable. And with the rate that it's mutating at, where would it go from there? Will that happen this winter? I, I, I'm telling you, I seriously, this is beyond knee jerk at this point. I've given all this a lot of thought. It's been sinking in for months and years. I am really concerned about that at this point. I think it's, it's a possibility with the direction that the virus evolution has been heading in across all these strains. <clears throat> anyway, originally the agency made only a narrow, so, so yeah, so this whole thing of the availability of effective treatments and prevention tools, uh, that treatment and prevention is thinner than ever. What they want to do is anything but um, behavioral oriented prevention, you know, masking and, and targeted shutdowns, but that, that's your last line of defense is the shutdown, quarantining, isolation, all that stuff. They're, they won't do any of it, and they're trying to rely on monoclonal antibodies, which the Congress won't even fully fund, and Paxlovid. And these things are not uniformly effective at all. Also, there's plans in 2023 to have all this stuff not be government subsidized in the same way, and to just be drugs that you have to pay for. It's completely on the individual to pay for it. And Paxlovid is an expensive drug. So that's horrible news, especially in a country where you know, tens of millions of people really effectively have no insurance. So, continuing. Um, originally, the agency made only a narrow set of exceptions for not masking indoors. For example, Americans visiting patients could, quote, choose not to wear source control if they were all up to date on their vaccines when alone together in a room. Again, that's, that's still bad advice because people um, who are fully vaccinated, they're likely to have, if infected, lower uh, viral loads, but they would still have a viral load and they would still be contagious. So anyway, that was already bad. Now we're going from bad to worse. Doctors and nurses who are up to date on their shots could take their mask off when in parts of their hospital not seeing patients like a kitchen or staff meeting room. So you can't spread it directly to the patients, only indirectly by, you know, uh, giving it to somebody else uh, in the staff. Instead, after Friday's revisions, the agency now has exceptions for where masking, quote, remains recommended. Can we all agree that recommendations mean absolutely nothing here? If you don't actually force people to do it, it's not gonna happen. That's just the way that it is. <clears throat> These include situations like during an outbreak among patients. Well, that's gonna be continuous because of this policy. Or quote, when caring for patients who are moderately to severely immunocompromised. And well, who have been rated that way anyway. You know, patients who are recognized as such. Holly Harmon, a senior vice president for the American Healthcare Association and the National Center for Assisted Living, celebrated the decision in a statement. Quote, while our commitment to infection prevention and control continues, while, while we're still supposed to care about this on paper, adapting COVID protocols means recognizing the current stage of this pandemic. Yeah, which is worse than it has been at many stages of the pandemic. So why are you lowering rather than, you know, continuing your guard? Uh, adapting COVID protocols means recognizing the current stage of this pandemic as well as the importance of quality of life for our nation's seniors, Harmon said. Harmon said that the group, which claims to be the largest association representing long-term care facilities, look forward to its, quote, ongoing collaboration with the CDC and other public health officials on COVID-19 guidance. Okay, so you're in on it. That's what you're saying. 
Quote, after more than two years, residents will get to see more of their caregivers' smiling faces. Hey, if you're in the hospital or a nursing home, which would you rather see? Your caregivers' smiling faces? Or you know, would you rather have the smile or would you rather be protected from a virus that would potentially knock you out or give you dementia or something like that? And our dedicated staff will get a moment to breathe. Fuck you. Fuck you. The new guidance comes as the U.S. has recorded a weeks-long slowdown in the pace of COVID-19 hospitalizations and nursing home infections in most part of the country. So in other words, we got to get those numbers up. I mean, really, like we're in a sustained outbreak and you can see it from the wastewater. We're in a sustained outbreak. It's down a little bit from the August peak of when BA5 came in, but it's still at the same level that it was at throughout April, May, and June, which is a really bad level. It's as bad as anything except for Omicron. So they're, anyway, this is what they did with the masking recommendations back in the winter and spring. It's like, oh, if, if it's already too late and COVID's spreading a lot, then we'll put masks on. You know, the idea of prevention is that you don't get to that point in the first place. You have to keep the masks on until the virus goes extinct. That's what you have to do to control this thing. But for now, the CD says, Excuse me, CDC says that um, COVID-19 metrics have not improved enough in most communities for hospitals and nursing homes to let up on masking. Well, obviously, the CDC's guidance for the general public now relies on its community levels ratings rolled out earlier this year, which factor in levels of hospitalization to come up with weekly ratings. Um, that is the puppies and rain, I almost said it again, puppies and rainbows map. You know what I almost said. Uh, that's the one where it's like, hey, uh, if there's room in the ER, drunk driving laws don't apply. Except the, the COVID version where it's like, hey, if there's room in the hospitals, then you don't have to wear a mask. Well, no, you're acting like death is the only possible negative outcome of the situation. Getting COVID, especially getting it three or four times, can probably, well, first of all, getting COVID once can shrink your brain and cause aging and inflammation equivalent to a decade of aging uh, and cause actual shrinking of your brain's volume. So like brain damage that doesn't repair itself. Uh, that's good in COVID once. It can also directly infect T cells. So it's gonna, there's a lot of people that had uh, lowered T cell counts for like up to a year after a COVID infection if they have long COVID. So there's all kinds of things, but uh, if you get COVID three or four times, we're gonna look at a, a chart of how your odds of um, things go up. We've covered this in previous streams. It's got really, really serious uh, repercussions as far as shaving years off of your life and increasing your risks of very serious uh, outcomes like deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism and all kinds of stuff. Anyway, um, so that's the community levels thing. So just 3.5% of Americans now live in counties with high community levels. Yeah, that's because they completely changed the metrics for that. That was done earlier this year. Also, they say in healthcare settings, the CDC says it will still rely on its original actual map community transmission benchmarks. By this measure of reported cases and test positivity, 73% of counties are currently rated at high risk. So that's the real map. And I mean, thank God for small favors. In healthcare settings, they're at least relying on the, uh, the real map. But if you're just going on the high, like the absolute worst red alert outcome, that and you're ignoring moderate and like lower transmission, that is not evidence-based. That's going to get everything up too high, which seems to be where they want it. I'm having a hard time reaching any other conclusion here because it's literally like, unless it's at the highest uh, metric of like, you know, the highest category of spread, then they're removing all the measures that would keep it from becoming the highest level of spread if it isn't already. So anyway, three quarters of counties are currently at high risk. The rest are moderate to low and within the moderate to low, the overwhelming majority are moderate. So 73% are high and most of the rest are like 20% uh, of the overall cases are just behind it. 
this is probably going to push it into into overdrive again. I mean, anyway, community transmission, the quoting now, is the metric currently recommended to guide select practices in healthcare settings to allow for earlier intervention before there's strain on the healthcare system. We're at, anyway, and to better protect the individuals seeking care in these settings, the CDC says in its guidance. The CDC also tightened some of its recommendations, reflecting what is now known about the Omicron variant. Yeah, because that was the other thing about making the puppies and rainbows map. It, I don't believe, was even based on Omicron. It was based on Delta. One such tweak upends long-standing recommendations not to test most people after a close contact if they have recovered from a previous COVID infection in the last 90 days. Instead, the CDC says that testing in these situations, quote, should be considered for those who have recovered in the prior 31 to 90 days. A growing, but even though we know that people can um, retain the infection for longer and be contagious in some cases. So again, throwing care out the window just as we're heading into fall and winter. A growing body of evidence suggests that people can be reinfected by Omicron variant infections within 90 days of recovering, for sure. Uh, a report published by the CDC from doctors in France tallied people who were infected as many as three times within months, as many as three times within months by different strains of the Omicron variant. Quote, our findings indicate that the time between confirmed primary infections and reinfections with different Omicron subvariants is frequently shorter than the 90-day definition of reinfections used by the US CDC. Again, it's not the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, it's the US Centers for Disease, the CD. The study's authors wrote before the CDC changes guidance. So the CDC has the science. They know that you can get frequently, like it's often the case that you can get reinfected within 90 days. As many as three times within months. The CDC knows it and they're making indication or they're making recommendations to the com, uh, contrary and then meanwhile you got your uh, alliance of you know for-profit uh, nursing homes and whatever saying like oh no our caregivers smiling faces are more important than a virus this is like shameless i mean with the airlines that were lobbying to get all these restrictions pulled for for uh, you know the transportation mandates pulled you can at least say well they're at least not healthcare organizations. They're just transportation. It's still scummy. They're still knowingly endangering public health, but at least their primary mission isn't healthcare. Well, here it is. But as we know with capitalism, the need, the profit mandate, it's not just the profit motive, it's the profit mandate, means that profits and usually short-term profits come before everything else. It constrains the science even in a medical setting, the more that the medical industry is operated on a for-profit basis. Again, we did a thing about, uh, you know, how Medicare for All would have saved hundreds of thousands of lives, um, let alone all the costs. So this is where we're at. So that's breaking. And I'll tell you what, I said we we're going to check in with the chat twice um, at the top of the stream and at the end. I'm going to go ahead and just get through all the COVID stuff now because it's it's been a priority anyway and let's just make sure that we get through it now that we've sort of opened the COVID box. So I'm gonna continue with the other COVID articles that I have. I'm just gonna go in order here. So just to recap, this is from the Daily Record in the UK. New COVID variant BF7 is spreading quickly and could be dominant within weeks. Uh, this is from the 22nd, two days ago by Neil Shaw and Nicola Roy. The BF7 variant has been found in the UK as well as uh, several other European countries. We did cover BF7. This is, again, just a recap. Scientists have warned that a new strain of COVID has been detected and is spreading around the world rapidly. The variant BF7, also known as BA5217, you can see why they call it BF7, is reportedly making up a quarter of Belgium's COVID cases and 10% of cases in Denmark, France, and Germany. According to the WHO, reduced, vir excuse me, reduced virus surveillance such as the lifting of restrictions and more social mixing means a challenging, that's one way to put it, deadly is another, autumn and winter ahead of us. Dr. Stuart Ray, Vice Chair of Medicine for Data Integrity and Analytics at Johns Hopkins Department of Medicine told Fortune, quote, the same growth advantage in multiple countries makes it reasonable to think that BF7 is gaining a foothold. What's a growth advantage? It means that one strain of the virus um, grows more rapidly than other strains, so it can outcompete 
you know, BA5 was like king of the roost for a while. But this is the way that the Omicron family of stuff goes. Omicron was a big mutation away from Delta. Uh, it's the most mutated, like, quantum leap that the virus has made. And then there are subvariants within that. Probably at some point, with the amount of spread that's happening, we will get another quantum leap away from the Omicron family. That's like a real jump in the number of mutations. Right now, we're still dealing with the basic, the Omicron paradigm when it comes to the genetic composition of the virus. But it's had all these substrains. BA1 was original Omicron, BA2, BA3 was short-lived, BA4 and 5 are, you know, driving the kind of recent stuff. And then substrains of what's been big this year. BA2 uh, was driving the basically outbreak in March, April, May. Then BA4 and BA5 came in. Now we've got son of BA2, BA2.75. We've got daughter of BA4, BA4.6. And we have child of BA5, BF7. So now we've got three pretty nasty strains that can outcompete their parent strains moving in. And, uh, you know, there's the bivalent booster. However, we don't know how this works with Omicron, but with earlier strains, we covered a study on this. If you had recovered from an, an infection within the previous six months, your B cells, in a lot of the people studied, like it was, it was a significant finding statistically. If you had been infected with a pre-Omicron strain uh, within six months, then your reaction to the booster shot wasn't as effective because your immune system to do the kind of response that it needs to do and learn from the booster shot, it was still uh, so set back from the infection that you couldn't get a proper response. You would have a reduced response. It's not that it was worthless, but you would not get the full protection. Now, does this apply to Omicron? We don't know. And that's why you don't fuck around with a novel virus, because we just don't know. We're in uncharted territory here. So it could be that these bivalent boosters are really good, really successful, and it could be that if you have had a, a COVID case in the last six months, like, for example, the sustained surge we've been seeing since March or April, that they're not as effective, which would mean that it would be more medically prudent, make more sense to wait until that six months has elapsed. We don't have the data because we're flying by the seat of our pants here. We don't know what the optimal recommendation would be. Therefore, and especially with the amount of COVID just being spread, it probably makes sense to just go get the bivalent booster. But we don't know how it's most effective to get. And this is the situation that the politicians working on behalf of capital have put us in. All right. He added, um, it's been a while since we went from alpha to beta to gamma to delta, then to Omicron. We may be complacent. This may be feeding into the notion that this is behind us. Good point. It's also probably why some of these Omicron subvariants should have gotten their own letter, but didn't. Because the government agencies are encouraging this kind of complacent thinking. Whereas if we got a new letter, let's say for BA2 or BA4 or BA5, we might be going, oh, wow, there's a lot of new variants. We should stay on guard. Again, back to normal is complacency and it is self-destructive. Kevin Cavanaugh, president and founder of the patient advocacy organization HealthWatch USA, told Fierce Healthcare, quote, it is anyone's guess if BF7 rapid growth will continue. So far it has, and I see no reason to think that it wouldn't. Aaron Prater, writing for Fortune, said, quote, scientists are taking notice of BF7 because it's making headway in an increasingly crowded field of Omicron subvariants. Cove Spectrum says a few hundred cases have been detected in the UK so far, mostly in England. Well, Again, we're uh, up to whatever it said, 2.3%, I think. We're just looking at the chart. Official guy, and again, compare that to BA uh, 4.6 or BA 2.75, which took comparatively longer to get to that point. Anyway, uh, like BA 2.75, for example, was spreading a lot in India. It made landfall in the U.S., but really wasn't taking off but now it is, or it's sl slowly starting to climb. Official guidance from NHS Inform says that you should stay at home if you have any symptoms. These include continuous cough, 
high temperature, fever or chills, loss of or change in your normal sense of taste or smell, which by the way, may not come back for a year, if ever, shortness of breath, unexplained tiredness or lack of energy. Most people, they say, no longer need to test for COVID. Yes, you do. Yes, you fucking do. Why wouldn't you need to? Why wouldn't you need to? It, there's, there's no rationale given. But tests are still available for specific groups, including health and social care workers. Why would you, why would you have needed a test six months ago, but you wouldn't have to now? Like, what, what's the actual basis for that? All right. <clears throat> I'm just gonna go right down the line as far as alphabetical order. If we jump around a little bit on topic within COVID, you'll have to forgive me. Um, Eric Feigelding. Now this guy, not a socialist, he's like, you know, full-throated, middle of the road, um, liberal. Uh, seem, seems like he, he has some okay ethics, but is politically a bit, you know, liberal and clueless. Um, does not though, unlike some other COVID watchers that doctor, I forget her name, but who is blocking quote, Marxists. This guy will actually let you uh, support him and, and comment and retweet and all that stuff uh, if, you, if you're a socialist. Anyway, breaking the credibility of the Federal Reserve Bank, saying COVID-19 will be entering a, quote, new normal as we soon enter winter with new variants is insanity. It is absolute ableism of banks to dismiss that 12,000 to 15,000 uh, COVID deaths a month is normal. It is horse dung. Hashtag COVID is not over. So this is breaking Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell said that the U.S. economy may be entering a, quote, new normal following disruptions from the COVID-19 pandemic. Following disruptions? The disruptions aren't going to stop. They're ongoing. This is denial of the highest order. Um, we have absolutely no reason to think that they would stop now. Um, I had another thing following up on that. Here it is. Uh, so this is from WSWS.org. Uh, Trotskyists, of course, we're not Trotskyists here at this channel, just to clear that up, but we do cover media from wherever it's coming out. Obviously, uh, we're not CBS News liberals either, but we do read CBS News sometimes. Anyway, vowing pain, Federal Reserve pledges to slash workers' wages. It's by Jerry White from yesterday, September 23rd. On Wednesday, and this is a longer article, this is just an excerpt, on Wednesday, the U.S. Federal Reserve increased the federal funds rate by three quarters of a point, continuing the fastest pace of rate hikes <clears throat> since the 1980s. The action will immediately increase the cost of home mortgages, which we've talked about this before in housing crisis videos. The base price of a house right now, like a middle class house in the 90s that would have cost, you know, 30 years ago, uh, 100000 to 150000 now costs four hundred to 500000 $500,000. That's the base price. On top of that, the price of the mortgage, the interest rate on the mortgage, is substantially higher than it was even a year or two ago. So trying to buy a house, I mean, it just, housing is a basic need, a basic right. Most countries around the world at least nominally recognize this. There was a UN declaration on human rights, including economic rights, and uh, they, they kind of treat those separately. But um, many countries were signatories to the economic rights bill that included uh, housing rights. Many of the countries, of course, due to the constraints of capitalism, only nominally recognize the right to housing. The U.S. won't even sign on to it. They won't even recognize it nominally. Anyway, the uh, action will immediately increase the cost of home mortgages, car loans, and credit cards for working class and middle class families. Um, Weird phrasing, honestly, from communists, but uh, <laughs> middle class already struggling with the highest surge in inflation in four decades. In his comments Wednesday, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell declared that, quote, economic pain was necessary to reduce inflation. So that thing you're feeling now, <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. That's not pain. That's a minor tingling. He went on to say that the members of the Federal Open Market Committee expected unemployment to rise from the current 3.7% to 4.4% in 2023, an increase that would mean the destruction of 1.3 million jobs. Powell made it clear that the Fed was willing to throw the economy into a recession, destroying millions of more jobs. That's the excerpt that we're going to read. Um, that's, uh, you know, th this is what is looming ahead. Pain, in their own words. Pain is what is looming ahead. 
So anyway, uh, th this is this is where all this stuff is coming from. Is it you know efforts to discipline the unruly labor force that thinks that we will just uh, do quiet quitting and whatever the fuck else? Who knows? Anyway, let's continue on down the line with the COVID stuff. Make sure I get all this in today. So this is from, oh boy, you know, I had the, oh, East Carolina University, Brody School of Medicine. COVID Parkinson's link. ECU researchers find possible link between COVID-19 and Parkinson's disease. So if you're new to this channel, go back over the COVID-19 playlist. We have covered dozens of articles detailing the wide ranging whole body effects of COVID-19 infections and of long COVID, including damage to the nervous system, uh, heart, lung, liver, immune, gut, kidney, etc. damage, like any major organ, any anywhere in the body really that has ACE2 receptors can be affected by COVID-19, but it does cause brain damage and, and other things. And it's also uh, affects your uh, blood vessels, your capillaries, your arteries, your veins, and it, it causes microclots in your capillaries and all kinds of horrendous inflammatory damage. And it causes the damage, the inflammatory damage by multiple routes. There is evidence that the COVID virus, the spike protein itself, can simulate uh, a part of your immune system that, you know, inflammation, like when you get a cut or you, you know, bang part of your body, you get some swelling. It's part of your uh, natural immune response to a point that assists in, in certain phases of your healing and, and immune responses. Um, but inflammation can also cause tissue, tissue damage if it's being done inappropriately. COVID, the, the SARS coronavirus, can directly stimulate uh, parts of your immune system responsible for inflammation, triggering inflammation where it is not needed. Plus, your body in just responding to the virus will also cause uh, inflammation. So a lot of the damage it causes is inflammatory in nature. But the, the clotting thing is, is another big part. Anyway, continuing. So uh, this is by Benjamin Abel. A team of scientists led by researchers from East Carolina University's Brody School of Medicine have identified another problem stemming from COVID-19 infections, the potential for greater risk of Parkinson's disease. The ECU contingent of researchers, Dr. Jeffrey Eels, 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 Dr. Shaw Akula, Dr. Srinivas Sriramula, and Dr. Dorcas O'Rourke, uh, we're joined by Dr. Rich Smain from Thomas Jefferson University and Dr. Pete Schmidt from New York University in a study of how COVID-19 infections could increase the likelihood of developing Parkinson's disease through studying preclinical pre models that had recovered from COVID-19 exposure. The research team determined that the subjects were more sensitive to the effects of a Parkinson's disease-inducing toxin. The models that showed Parkinson's-like brain disruption were infected with COVID-19, but did not get noticeably ill, much in the way that most humans infected with COVID-19 may have felt sick, but did not need to be hospitalized. In other words, asymptomatic to mild cases. And this is, uh, you know, as far as the brain shrinkage I was talking about, that's even asymptomatic or mild cases can cause brain shrinkage and aging of your brain equivalent to a decade's worth of natural aging. I think that this model represents people that are, are mo more susceptible to the virus infections. The subjects that we used got infected because they have antibodies to the virus, but, uh, oh, sorry. This is strangely worded. I think he means the subjects that we used got infected, but because they have antibodies to the virus, they weren't really sick. Uh, because they have antibodies, uh, oh, oh, I see what he's saying. All right, my apologies. The subjects that we used got infected, and we know that they got infected because they have antibodies. I think that's what he's trying to say. But they weren't really sick. So they might not have known that they were sick, but they have the antibodies, which means that they did get sick. Okay. An associate professor of anatomy and cell biology at Brody. The team's results reflect similar findings uh, from an analysis of nearly 1 million Danish health records that found COVID-19 patients were more likely to be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease as well as Alzheimer's disease, stroke, and bleeding in the brain. Cases of Parkinson's or Parkinson's-like symptoms, conditions, following positive testing for COVID-19 have also been reported in Israel, Spain, and Italy. In the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, 
Eels began to consider the long-term consequences of the new virus. Eels and his team secured a portion of the CARES Act funding ECU received from the North Carolina General Assembly in 2020 and began work in February 21 with the study results accumulating into the final paper in the fall of 2021. Quote, we're seeing a lot of long COVID patients now who are still having symptoms six months, a year, or two years out after being infected. But there's also the potential that those infections could have consequences later on in life. It's going to be five to 10 years, that's what I keep saying, before we have any of this epidemiological data to say, yes, it does increase risk for neurological disorders or neurode neurodegenerative disorders. So keep in mind, when you get HIV, which hopefully nobody here does, but um, that is has you know colder flu-like symptoms at first. But you know is long HIV a thing? Yeah, we call it AIDS. So just because something in the acute phase is mild or moderate or even asymptomatic does not mean that it doesn't have long long-term consequences on your body. Also doesn't mean that it does, but there is that potential. Eels and his team suggest that flu and COVID-19 share a common trait. They increase the inflammatory response within the body, which may prompt the brain to release proteins to fight the initial infections. These proteins, pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, are thought to set the conditions for further damage to the nervous system. The 1918 influenza pandemic was associated with an increased rate of Parkinson's disease and influenza infections causing hospitalization have been shown to elevate the risk for developing Parkinson's. While other respiratory viruses, now here's a mistake because COVID is not just a respiratory virus, that's usually how it's spread. And yes, the lungs have tons of ACE2 receptors. They tend to be the hardest hit organ, but other organs are right behind it. Anyway, particularly the 2009 H1N1 flu strain showed similar Parkinson's-inducing effects as COVID-19. Those diseases weren't as likely to cause the same levels of damage to the nervous system, resulting in the possibility of development of Parkinson's-like symptoms. The authors of the ECU-led study suggest that COVID-19 could have a significant impact on society if those infected do end up more susceptible to Parkinson's disease, creating the possibility of a, quote, substantial burden on patients, families, and society in the coming years and decades. Eels said that the study is particularly important for Parkinson's research because it gives a window into how a virus impacts the totality of the organs and systems in the human body. So remember, you know, basic sort of biological um, levels of recognized organization. You have your cell. Cells make tissues. Tissues make organs. Organs make systems, and systems make an organism. Okay. Viral infections also affect different hosts in different ways, which necessitates further study of COVID-19's interaction with the body. A virus in an animal might produce no symptoms of disease, but the same dose of the same virus in the human could be lethal, Acula said. Quote, well, different viruses behave differently. Some cause pathogenesis in, oh, some may cause pathogenesis, that's disease initiation, in human beings, but zero in animals, Acula said. This study gives Eels a glimmer of hope that understanding how infections like COVID-19 increase the risk of developing Parkinson's might lead to treatments that reduce the risk that infections and other inflammatory conditions might lead to the onset of neurodegenerative diseases. Quote, using this model will allow us to test hypotheses about how infections could increase the risk of Parkinson's disease with the goal of finding treatments to prevent or eliminate COVID-19 as a risk, Eels said. The ECU researchers are already refining their findings on a study that may implicate COVID-19 in the exacerbation of Alzheimer's and other dementia-like conditions. We're interested in other neurodegenerative disorders, specifically multiple sclerosis, as well as Alzheimer's disease, Eels said. Anytime you increase the level of inflammation, that increases the risk that you're going to develop a neurologic or neurodegenerative disorder later on. <clears throat> so that's the end of that article. Let's get a sip of uh, water here. Inflammation. <clears throat> it's something we try to avoid. As far as ongoing health and wellness and prevention, avoiding inflammation is huge. This is why a healthy diet that is lower in animal products, higher in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts, it's the, you know, those foods that tend to have uh, more anti-inflammatory stuff, um, some herbal teas and things like that, if you drink those on a regular basis, also anti-inflammatory, uh, not all of them, but some of them. And there are other ways to do that, getting good sleep and all that kind of stuff, you know, anything that's gonna lower inflammation. 
This is one of the things that ages you. So, you know, we've talked about this before. There's a lot of people who take this idiotic, uh, polarized either or approach. Oh, I don't, you know, I don't believe in science. I don't believe in medicine. I just do natural things. Well, natural things are great, but you can do all this stuff. You can get perfect sleep. You can get a good amount of cardiovascular exercise on a regular basis. You can eat a healthy diet full of, you know, eat your colors, lots of fruits and vegetables, all kinds of stuff, which tend to have antioxidant and some anti-inflammatory compounds in them. All this stuff can be great, but then you get COVID and boom, you just set yourself back like 20 years. Who knows? You know, so, um, you know, <laughs> this is where getting the vaccine and avoiding infection, you know, this idiotic, like, I'm not going to live in fear. I'm not going to wear a mask. Well, you're not going to live in fear, but the virus is real. And so you're going to live in disease instead. That, that doesn't make any sense. If your whole thing is you're trying to go for, you know, longevity and health, um, avoiding this stuff makes absolutely uh, a ton of sense. You know, avo oh, sorry, avoiding the sort of things that can mitigate your COVID uh, viral load and stuff, that makes no sense. But yeah, avoiding the virus, that, that makes complete sense. Just like exposing yourself to the virus because of like, it's in God's hands or, you know, you're just going to let nature take its course. That's um, idiotic. And honestly, your ancestors are rolling in their graves. People don't just like get sick. Uh, people, tr people try to avoid that stuff. <clears throat> um, here's another one. Uh, same basic note. COVID-19 infection in crucial, crucial brain regions may lead to accelerated brain aging. That's what we were talking about before. August 5, 2022. By the way, um, the thing I keep citing about the brain shrinkage, nationalgeographic.co.uk, uh, even mild COVID infections can cause your brain to shrink. Look it up. Summary. The effects of COVID-19 infection on neurological health are becoming more apparent. A new study reveals that COVID-19 can predispose people to irreversible neurological conditions, accelerate brain aging, and increase the risk of stroke and brain bleed. Sources Houston Methodist. A new study by Houston Methodist researchers reviews the emerging insights and evidence that suggest that COVID-19 infections may have both short and long-term neurological effects. Major findings include that COVID-19 infections may predispose individuals to developing irreversible neurological conditions, may increase the likelihood of strokes, and may increase the chance of developing persistent brain lesions that can lead to brain bleeding. Led by corresponding authors Joy Mitra, PhD, instructor, and Mura Lidar L. Hegda, PhD, professor of neurosurgery with the Division of DNA Repair within the Center for Neuroregeneration at the Houston Methodist Research Institute, the research team described their findings in an article entitled SARS Coronavirus 2 and the Central Nervous System, Emerging Insights into Hemorrhage Associate, Hemorrhage's Bleeding, Associated Neurological Consequences and Therapeutic Considerations in the journal Aging Research Reviews. Still a major burden on our daily lives, a great deal of research has shown that the impacts of the disease go far beyond the actual time of infection. That's what I say. Got to differentiate between the first few weeks, the acute phase, and beyond that. Since the onset of the pandemic, COVID-19 has surpassed a death toll of more than 5.49 million worldwide and more than 307 million confirmed positive cases, with the U.S. accounting for almost 90 million of those cases according to the Our World in Data website. COVID-19 is known to invade and infect the brain, among other major organs. While a lot of research has been done to help us understand the evolution, infection, and pathology of the disease, there's still a great deal that remains unclear about the long-term effects, especially on the brain. The coronavirus infection can cause long-term and irreversible neurodegenerative diseases, particularly in the elderly and other vulnerable populations. Several brain imaging studies on COVID-19 victims and survivors have confirmed the formation of microbleed legions in deeper brain regions related to our cognitive and memory functions. If you're not concerned about this, hang it up. I mean, what are you concerned about? In this review study, researchers have critically evaluated the possible chronic neuropathological outcomes in aging and comorbid populations if timely therapeutic intervention is not implemented. There's a lot of lingo in there. Let's break that down. In the review study, researchers have critically evaluated the possible chronic, that is long-term, uh, neuropathological, that is 
disease affecting, excuse me, there's a motor noise going. All right, let's try that again. Chronic is long-term, neuropathological, is path, pathology is disease, neuro is your nervous system, including the brain. Outcomes in aging and comorbid populations, comorbidity, morbidity is sickness or disease, so comorbid is having other, um, other sicknesses at the same time. Populations, if timely, therapeutic intervention is not implemented. Therapeutic intervention is a therapy, a treatment, and timely, obviously, you know, not just letting it run its course. All right, microbleeds are emerging neuropathological signatures frequently identified in people suffering from chronic stress, depressive disorders, diabetes, and age-associated comorbidities. Based on their earlier findings, the investigators discuss how COVID-19-induced microhemorrhagic lesions may exacerbate DNA damage in affected brain cells, resulting in neuronal senescence. What is that? Senescence is aging out, it's like so senile, it's the same, it's senator, it's actually, it just means aging. Uh, neuronal, your neurons are where your, uh, well, it's uh, nerve cells, ba basically, uh, this is, you know, the whole system of synapses, communication between neurons. Um, so, anyway, exacerbating DNA damage in affected brain cells resulting in neuronal senescence and activation of cell death mechanisms. So this is basically brain cell aging and cell death mechanisms, which ultimately impact brain microstructure, microstructure vasculature. Vasculature is your blood vessels. So your brain is what we would say very well vascularized. There's a lot of blood vessels going to your brain, which is a very high demand organ for blood, for oxygen, for nutrients, for sugar, all that stuff. And um, yeah, so this, this uh, let's read the sentence again. Based on their earlier findings, the investigator discuss how COVID-19 induced, so COVID-19 is causing microhemorrhagic lesions, so small uh, bleeding lesions, exacerbating DNA damage in affected brain cells, resulting in aging and death, which ultimately impact the brain microstructure and, and vasculature. So that's pretty severe, like brain damage at the, at the micro level, which adds up. These pathological phenomena resemble hallmarks of neurodegenerative conditions. Neurodegenerative is something that deteriorates over time, like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And they're likely to aggravate advanced stage dementia as well as cognitive and motor deficits. So when we say neurodegenerative, it gets worse over time, it degenerates. So like Alzheimer's, you know, you think of dementia, it tends to start with um, just memory problems or bursts of inappropriate behavior, things like that. Uh, confusion about where somebody is or who they're talking to or who they are or what year it is, stuff like that. And it can eventually devolve into just full-blown complete detachment from an inability to process reality. So they're saying that what COVID-19 does, the damage that it causes in the brain, is similar to hallmarks of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and it's likely to aggravate advanced stage dementia, cognitive and motor deficits. Deficit is falling short of something. So cognitive and motor deficits are not being able to think or control your motions to the full range of what you would normally be able to do. Um, the effects of COVID-19 infection on various parts of the central nervous system are currently being studied. For instance, 20 to 30% of COVID-19 patients report a lingering psychological condition known as brain fog. I have had this, where individuals suffer from symptoms such as memory loss, difficulty in concentrating, forgetting daily activities, difficulty in selecting the right words, taking longer than usual time to complete a regular task, disoriented thought processes, and emotional numbness. More severe long-term effects analyzed in the Houston Methodist Review article include predisposition for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and related neurodegenerative diseases, as well as cardiovascular disorders due to internal bleeding and blood clotting induced lesions in parts of the brain that regulate our respiratory system following the COVID-19 symptoms. So clotting induced lesions, lesions are sores basically. So um, blood clotting induced lesions in parts of the brains that regulate our respiratory system.
that's bad. We've done stu- uh, we've read in the COVID update studies on the uh, COVID 19s affinity for the brain stem in particular. So different regions of your brain control different parts of your nervous system and and your your I mean your your personality, your cognitive functions, everything. Your brain stem tends to be the part that we you know share in common with like the most other animals and it's mostly involuntary stuff like your heart beating and your you know breathing and like all those kinds of reflexes and things so um you know it's true that covid can directly damage the lungs but also covid is doing damage to the if you will the control box the sort of fuse box in your brainstem that controls a lot of these autonomic um, you know, involuntary uh, responses. So, additionally, cellular aging is thought to be accelerated in COVID-19 patients. A plethora of cellular stresses inhibit the virus-infected cells from undergoing their normal biological functions and let them enter into hibernation mode or even die completely. The study also suggests various strategies to improve some of these long-term neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative outcomes, as well as outlines the importance of the therapeutic regimen of the nanozyme in combination with various FDA-approved drugs that may prove successful to fight against this catastrophic disease. Making a note of nanozyme, that is actually the first uh, mention of that that I've heard, and I really have no idea what that is. I mean, uh, it sounds like an enzyme, but I don't know specifically. I've never heard nanozyme before. However, given the ever-evolving nature of this field, associations like the ones described in this review show the fight against COVID-19 is far from over, say the investigators, and they reinforce the message that getting vaccinated and maintaining proper hygiene are key in trying to prevent such long-term and detrimental consequences. Now, that's the end of the article. Missing from that statement is you can't just do this yourself. Getting vaccinated and maintaining proper hygiene, we also need to, on a societal level, prevent the spread. That means creating society-wide understandings and mandates that we do not allow this virus to spread. That means wearing masks. That means all kinds of other support, up to and including, as a last case scenario, targeted shutdowns uh, to prevent this virus from spreading unless we're gonna have a referendum of you know people presented with this sort of scientific research on hey uh this is going to up your odds of all kinds of crazy diseases which are just hell on earth losing your personality not knowing where you are being constantly terrified from alzheimer's um, having all the suffering involved in parkinson's disease etc are you really up for this just so that you can go to burger king without a mask on or so you can go get your hair done whenever you feel like it, even when there's a massive outbreak. All right, one more thing on this topic, and then we're going to uh, go to the uh, go to the chat. Now, here I said one more thing. Here's two. Um, this is from a study that I have not had time to fully screenshot, but let me get the title for you at least. <clears throat> it's a uh, diagram that's been retweeted quite a bit. I believe that this is from a study, The Long-Term Neurologic Outcomes of COVID-19, published in Nature Medicine. So it's small, but down the side, we and this just came out this week, and it's, I believe, not a preprint. This is a fully reviewed, published study. Um, cerebrovascular disorders, cognition and memory disorders, disorders of peripheral nerves, episodic disorders, extrapyramidal and movement disorders, mental health disorders, musculoskeletal disorders, sensory disorders, and other neurologic or related disorders are the categories. Then, breaking those down, so we see like TIA, hemorrhagic stroke, memory problems, Alzheimer's disease, uh, Bell's palsy, migraine, epilepsy, and seizures, headache disorders, <clears throat> abnormal involuntary movements, tremors, Parkinson's-like disease, um, major depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, psychotic disorders, stress and adjustment disorders, joint pain, myalgia, myopathy, that's uh, muscle pain and muscle um, disease, abnormal uh, hearing or tinnitus that's ringing in your ears, which often can be painful and can interfere with like sleep, for example, because 
when you're in silence, that's when uh, tinnitus or tinnitus tends to be worse. Loss of smell, loss of taste, dizziness, uh, somnolescence, that is uh, sleepiness, um, and, and so on. So these are the diseases that we're talking about. Select list, I skipped over some, that you're at increased risk for. Now, what we can see on uh, the color coding there, it's down in the right-hand bottom corner. Green is non-hospitalized COVID patients. Red is hospitalized COVID patients and purple is people who are hospitalized and put in the ICU. So you can see that across those three statuses in every single case that I can see here, uh, non-hospitalized has significantly elevated, but the least amount, then hospitalized has significantly elevated and the, the middle status. And then if you if it was bad enough, you got put in the ICU, even worse, uh, increased odds of this. So we have the, um, the harm risk on the left column and then the excess burden per 1,000 persons on the right. Those are the, those are the colored bars. You can see that your odds of all this stuff, your risk of all this stuff go up, even if you get COVID and aren't hospitalized. And um, that's true in pretty much every case across the board here. There's a couple of things where there's not... Um, so basically, if, if in the left column there that has the colors in it, so sort of in the middle, um, you can see by cerebral venous thrombosis, the green is crossing that dotted line. So the dotted line is one. That means baseline odds. If it's crossing one, then it means that one could be in the set. So that means not reduced risk. Uh, or sorry, not elevated risk. It means that it's the uh, normal risk is within the range of what they could narrow down the results to likely being. Also, um, transverse myelitis down at the bottom, the green crosses over. Basically, in everything else, it's, it's elevated. So, you know, do you want um, increased risk of epilepsy and seizures? I don't. Do you want increased risk of anxiety or psychotic disorders? I don't. But, you know, especially if you get hospitalized, your risk for that goes way up. So again, uh, that, that's that. One last article on this uh, topic, and then we'll, we'll check in with the chat. And, uh, oh, that, that is actually it. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to read from that one because I, I think we got the gist. Uh, that is the article that, that uh, came from, actually, I think, just to see how they did the study. Uh, this was people who use the Veterans Health Services, and then they went through, this is the flow chart basically of how they uh, selected the um, contemporary control case, the COVID-19, the historical control, which was like pre-pandemic, and then uh, made the comparisons, just if you're interested in that, how scientific studies uh, are done for this kind of thing. There, there are many different types of studies, but anyway, uh, there's the COVID stuff. We finally got to that. Let's check in with the chat and then we will close with uh, whatever seems most appropriate at that time. I'm going to take a break for just less than a minute. I'll be right back. Get your questions and comments ready. So let's see what's on our chatter's minds today. I think, actually, I'm, I'm very happy to have gotten all that done. I know a lot of people like the COVID coverage. And, you know, I mentioned, uh, just always like to make the point, this is not a Trotskyist channel, but credit where due to WSWS, I know that the um, w, uh, excuse me, WSWS people, World Socialist website, are actually keeping up on COVID stories which is more than I can say for a lot of left organizations. So whatever differences uh, we may have, a credit we're due there for sure. I, I salute you. All right, let's read some comments. All 
All right, here we go. Even at my late grandpa's dialysis clinic back in Canada prior to COVID, all the staff have to wear a mask and face shields as they had to deal with blood and stuff. Yeah, well, you know, this is appropriate uh, protection for working in the medical field. Um, I wonder what would happen if COVID became super lethal like SARS-1 and MERS. Would people take it seriously again? Uh, you would you would be back to a situation of literally people like dying in the streets practically. It would it would be uh, because SARS one I believe had a mortality of fifteen percent and MERS had thirty five percent. The thirty five percent it might be lower than that, but somewhat because it's possible that some uh, milder cases weren't identified, which could have brought down the average. But I mean it was like really really high mortality. So yeah, it would be unavoidable at that point. Um, no one would be, you know, uh, the, the amount of, I shouldn't say no one, never underestimate the um, psychotic fanaticism of uh, U.S. consumerism. Uh, but I think that the amount of people willing to forsake health for convenience and, you know, not letting the terrorists win, as George W. Bush would put it, um, in this case a virus, uh, you know, not letting the virus win, just go about your normal life, pretend, uh, whatever. Well, that, then that raises the whole question. Uh, the, the terrorism threat actually was hugely inflated. The virus threat, uh, actually the opposite. So anyway, you know, slap to the back of my hand for that one. But anyway, uh, yeah, I think that the amount of people willing to just ignore the thing would uh, go way, way, way down. Uh, I really hope it doesn't come to that, but I'm getting very concerned myself. Why doesn't the CDC just require everyone to just get injected with COVID? They should just come out in the open with their pro-virus agenda. Well, I mean, uh, that's virtually the point that they're at now. It's just blatant denialism, um, blatant denialism. You know, I need to check back in. We've covered the, the people's CDC before. I need to check back in with them and see how they're doing. We honestly and truly need a new CDC. The problem is that infrastructure, there's the national CDC and then there's like state um, CDCs as well. And they all kind of follow the same bullshit. I love how the libertarians think the vaccine is the thing killing everyone. And they're the geniuses who see through it all. Meanwhile, they're becoming more brain dead by catching COVID weekly. Now, if there's one thing libertarians do not need, it is more brain damage. Um, I had someone, and by the way, I don't mean to slight people who've had like traumatic brain injuries or things like that. Um, I've had long COVID myself and had the brain fog. This is not a good thing. So, you know, it is it is a bit of gallows humor here. We're absolutely on the side of, you know, this is, this is a conversation we're trying to include people with every health status in. Um, it's not really the people who understand the seriousness of health stuff you really have to worry about though uh, if i make jokes from time to time no i'm coming from a place as somebody who you know has dealt with um illnesses myself and recognize the seriousness that's why we're out here covering this when no one else is i had somebody tell me it's crazy people are dropping dead everywhere from the vaccine meanwhile no they're not like that the people who say that it's flat wrong it's just completely incorrect this, you know, I'll, I'll do it next time. There was a major study put out on myocarditis. That's heart muscle inflammation. And um, it's significantly lower, your risk of that, from the vaccine versus the virus. Like, it's not even close. And, I mean, it's like a, it's like six in 100,000 or something like that. Th those are your odds. <clears throat> so for, for the people who are like, what does it kill, less than 1% of people? Blah, blah. I mean, but these are the same people getting hysterical over, you know, these people don't really think for themselves, they don't think critically, it's whatever just their right wing stuff says, they, they don't think about it. But anyway, yeah, there's studies on the myocarditis from the vaccine, it's, it's a non-issue. And then I've gotten into things with other people, they're like, oh yeah, well, you know, our real issue, as they get, are forced to retreat, but they refuse to concede, they'll fall back onto, oh yeah, well, it's the mRNA vaccines. You know, uh, if they were using like attenuated virus or other kinds of vaccines, you know, that that would be fine. Oh yeah? 
Well, tell me this, what's the myocarditis rates of those vaccines like Sinopharm or you know anything else um, compared to the uh, Pfizer or Moderna? Yeah, they're about the same. So anyway, we'll, we'll cover that. We'll get into detail in, in maybe the next uh, COVID update. Let me make a note of that as well next to the nano, nanozyme. All right. Uh, then, then again, libertarians don't have to worry about catching the virus since they don't have friends or do anything in public. Um, possible, possible. But I mean, libertarians, what can you do? It is the, it is the political ide ideology of teenage boys. It, yes, that's very, very true. And, you know, man children that still have that mentality as well. Yeah, on Twitter, those kinds of people constantly share stories of people dying unexpectedly, and they blame the vaccine. They think hundreds of millions of people have died from the vaccine. No, yeah, but no one I know has had any bad complications in the vaccine. Yeah, they're rare, and they've been studied, and the results are published, and you can evaluate that risk. But they, they're constantly trying to just deny reality and do the mental gymnastics, etc., The vaccines just simply are not that dangerous, and the risk of them is far lower than from the virus. But again, that said, as a disease control strategy, in this case, the virus or the vaccine itself is insufficient. It's a last line of defense, not not a first line of defense. And that's where we obviously we oppose the rights, uh, the far rights, like full on COVID denialism. We also oppose Joe Biden's denial of the need for a comprehensive public health response. You know, but this is I've compared it before to um, climate denialism. And it's like, you know, the Republicans will full on deny they'll be like, oh, yeah, it's a Chinese hoax or whatever, like Trump would say with a climate emergency. The Democrats will acknowledge it in name, but then not really take sufficient measures to do anything about it. It's the exact same thing here. So this is what you can expect. Um, and there was a whole discussion. Uh, Allison Metzger, I think, is her name on Twitter sort of a progressive, you know, journalist or something, has a fair Twitter following, but was talking about how we don't have time for a revolution because of climate change and got ratioed harder than I've maybe ever seen before because literally the organizing that you would need to do to get meaningful action on climate change overlaps 100% with the organizing you would need to do for a revolution. You're not going to get meaningful action on climate change without a revolution. So those things exactly coincide. And so it is with COVID. You're not going to get meaningful action on COVID without a revolution. It, it, because that is the level of push required to get them to act. So organize for revolution. That's why this is a Marxist-Leninist channel. And that's what we're educating people about. Because if you don't organize for that, you're not going to get any of this. They're just... It, the capitalist class worldwide has shown their willingness to just discard these problems in favor of the more short-term profit mandate that capitalism that, that is at the heart of capitalism you know the capitalists they collude on maintaining capitalism but they're also locked in bitter competition with each other as capitalists because if they become less profitable another one will take over their operations and you know so they're they're locked in ruthless struggle with each other over short-term profits and they're all trying to outmaneuver each other that said they will always unite uh as needed to oppose um the proletariat you know to oppose socialism but that that, that is the that is the level of organizing we need to do so the idea that we we don't have time for a revolution are you fucking kidding me how do you like We've already tried asking them. They won't do it. They won't do it. Anyway. Uh, the degree to which many even otherwise reasonable people... Oh, the degree to which even many otherwise reasonable people have been led to believe that the pandemic is, quote, over is alarming. Yeah, it is it is growing month by month now. And it's, it's again, people just going with the flow. They, they don't know better, and they're not reading Biobot, and they don't know what's actually going on. When I raised the... And because... Nobody's telling them what's going on in the major, you know, capitalist news media. And the CDC sure as fuck isn't. 
When I raised these concerns among my own circle of friends and acquaintances, all of whom took the virus very seriously before, the responses I now encounter tend to run along the lines of, well, there are so many varying studies, it's impossible to know it's true. That's flatly incorrect. Uh, whoever said that is doesn't read any studies, I guarantee you. Uh, it's uh, Or yes, of course the virus still exists, but we're now at a level where we can handle it, unlike last year. Again, yeah, this is what Biden would like you to believe, and a lot of people do. So, let's see. I have never been worried about COVID government... Uh, sorry. I've never been worried about COVID... Okay, you need some punctuation in here. I've never w worried about COVID. Government needs to let me go about my day. Am I wrong for thinking that? Yeah. Yeah, you are, in my opinion. Pretty much all universities I know are back to normal and all restrictions and accommodations are gone. You can't even ask for any accommodation to teach online or anything. Yeah, RIP the U.S. educational system at all levels, really. Uh, there was a program I was going to do. I had to completely, uh, you know, reshape my plans, which had implications for uh, job and, and, you know, work career issues as well. So, yeah. Uh, I'm in a COVID activist group, and it's pretty depressing because it's such a small group, and even my local DSA chapter doesn't have a COVID working group anymore. Yeah, um, this is why we don't tail the Dems. Look at what the Dems are putting out. Pfizer must be making a killing off COVID, but vaccines don't prevent transmission. Yeah, people have speculated, like, are they actively interested in maintaining spread just so that they can sell cure, while also it plays into the austerity agenda. You know, if people retire at 65 and then live to 85, that's 20 years of pensions and Social Security and whatever. Uh, if you retire at 65 and die at 68, problem solved for the capitalist class. I think that since literally COVID has had so many chances to mutate, the deadliness is the only thing left for it to mutate, save the ability to get more immunoevasive. Yeah, well, that, that's how it's going to get there. You know, there can be more things to cause more direct inflammation and damage, but yeah, your immune system's inability to get, to like clear the infection is, is going to be big too. Uh, I swear that dumb Michael Bay movie Songbird with COVID-23 is going to become reality. You know, I missed that one. I missed that one. I'm going to have to write that down. All right. Not that I'm a big Michael Bay fan, but... Uh... Smiling faces are overrated in a pandemic. Some people have managed to avoid it. Yeah, that's good. Um, I swear the term thinning the herd and herd immunity are the only things people will say if they say anything. The brain damage part really scares me. I'm not smart enough to be able to afford brain damage. Um, you know, I'll say no matter what your sort of innate level of intelligence is, nobody should have brain damage. So somebody says, I would say the government has many ways of regulating us, some good, some not. Most things that could, well, you know, the thing, uh, thing about regulations like on business and things, a lot of them, some are there for inner, you know, capitalist uh, competition to like set fair rules among capitalists. That's not really a concern of ours uh, so much. Some regulations are there specifically as the result of workers' struggles for rights. And obviously we would oppose... Uh, you know, we, we want those things. Uh, we want the best conditions for waging class war that we possibly can have. We want all the liberties that we can get because uh, it helps us to wage class war. So anyway, uh, most things that could cause harm to others are regulated while some are not. If you drive a car in an unsafe way, you may lose your license to drive. If you operate businesses in an unsafe way, OSHA might fine you or worse. Yes, I mean, a lot of these regulatory agencies have been at least partially defanged, but uh, it does still happen. Why should COVID be different? By the way, speaking of OSHA, um, you can make, I believe, anonymous OSHA reports if you have unsafe conditions in your workplace uh, around certain things, safety issues, chemicals, different things um, like that, different procedures. Uh, you can look into that, particularly like if you are having trouble 
uh, like a union effort may not seem realistic, but there's like sort of an imminent threat. An anonymous OSHA report um, can sometimes do something for you. Anyway, continuing. Why should COVID be different? There were still choices you could make, like taking the vaccine or not, but depending on the choice, you could uh, have consequence. Well, yeah, the point is that we could have a much better overall societal response to COVID, which is the level that public health needs to operate on. It can't be on an individual level only. There are things individuals absolutely have to do, um, but you also need structural institutional support. China is the only country with the most sensible COVID policy, but if it's true that Xi Jinping was deposed today, Oh, this is news to me. And now a military junta is in control. I could almost see them open up the economy. Uh, yeah, I mean, unless it's a more communist military junta. I, this is the first time hearing of this. That being said, I prefer more choices. In a, uh, your, your freedom should not negate mine, make choices for me, or put others in danger. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense that your, your freedoms end where my rights begin kind of thing. But... Um, yeah, we, we need to move to like a much higher level of collective thinking about this. Uh, you know, diseases that you look at what's happening in the U.S., a million dead, tens of millions with long COVID. This is this is unacceptable and, and no end in sight. Hope this makes sense. Yeah, these are these are kind of like basic liberal free rights ideas. Um, we can move even beyond this. But uh, again, preserving the the freedoms under capitalism that we have. Again, it's about, as far as socialists are concerned, what are the uh, best conditions for us to wage class war in? Lenin wrote about this quite a lot. Yeah, another good point there, you are never an individual. You are always in contact with others. So the idea that you can have choices is literally a fantasy. Yeah, this is why the sort of bourgeois idealism breaks down, why we do need to move to a higher level of collective thinking because, um, it is true. A lot of your sense of yourself as an individual, to some ways it's real, but um, also in a lot of ways, the deeper you go inside an individual, the more you just find society reflected. You would not be you without the society that you live in at all. Anyway, continuing. Uh, maybe after midterms, they will tighten up regulations given high rise in numbers throughout winter. Uh, given the way they handled things last winter, I would not count on it. And especially some of the plans for 2023, like making Paxlovid just another drug on the market, it sounds like they're folding this whole thing up to me. Uh, I honestly hate that it's impossible to work at home now, being in a room with 50 young people and no one else wearing a mask makes me feel like I'm drowning in disease. Yeah, I mean, that mask is probably helping. I would probably upgrade to a P100 at that point. There are elastomeric P100s. Um, and there are also non-elastomeric P100s. I would probably upgrade to that at this point. Like if you're in a room with 50 people, nobody is masking, and they and they let you wear a P100. Absolutely, wear wear a P100. It's considered the gold standard for diseases transmitted, um, you know, in the way that COVID is. Jobs in my re <clears throat> excuse me. Jobs in my region are still paying eight or nine dollars an hour, while the rent for a one bedroom is seven hundred plus. Yeah, and in a lot of places, it's a lot higher than that. I don't understand. <clears throat> I don't understand how people are even capable of surviving. A lot of people aren't. This is why people are moving in in their thirties with like <clears throat> three or four roommates. Life as we knew it is gone. Life as we knew it is gone. You know, I I kind of adjusted to. Uh, you know, into adult life in the 2000s. It was rough then. I mean, I often had, you know, a hard time finding work. Like the Bush years were terrible. Um, the, the economy was not good and everything. But you could get by on less after 2008 and everything now. And it's, well, after 2008 and now in the pandemic, like post Trump, things started getting really bad. Prices like for housing started climbing in 2016. Things are completely out of control now. I mean, completely, you know, and the Democrats, of course, don't even mention the housing crisis. When I take a lift, I just always open a window because drivers don't mask anymore. Yeah. And of course, wear a mask yourself. But yeah, fresh air is going to be your friend in a situation like that.
So somebody says, um, I think somebody's off on the wrong foot and go live in another country and see what you think about your freedom then. Or just look at Iran, Iran news. Okay. Killing a girl for her hair being wrong. Yeah, I mean, it's true. Things could be worse in the U.S., although they are getting worse all the time. Like, for example, abortion rights just sort of got um, nixed this year in many places. So holding up the U.S. as some kind of like, you know, standard of freedom, things are getting worse here all the time. And um, yes, it's true. There are countries worse off. Uh, but uh, that's not uh, we we're looking forward to the future beyond capitalism not lesser evilism. So speaking of, this is one of the things that I, I wanted to uh, address. We covered uh, the Masa Amini death in Iran, and I had kind of pieced together that story from a few different um, sources online, and I somewhat misreported it. It's better in the community post that I put up about it. But basically, um, there is a, there was a woman, Masa Amini, lived in Kurdistan, in the northwest of Iran. She was in Tehran, the capital of Iran, and she was not wearing her headscarf, mandatory headscarf, in the way that is mandated by the morality police, as a literal thing, in Iran. And you know, whatever you think about religion, um, as far as a personal thing or whatever, uh, especially when it falls into the hands of you know, reactionary political regime. This is where things, it's no longer an individual choice. It's then uh, ruling class ideology at that point. I mean, you know, people uh, doing whatever spiritual meditation or whatever, uh, that's one thing when things become state religions and they become another way of enforcing class rule in class society is a different uh, situation entirely. Anyway, she was arrested um, by the morality police for improperly wearing her hijab. And uh, then she, when she resurfaced in a hospital, she had bruises all over her body and then was in a coma and died. So then there were subsequently many protests around Iran of women burning hijabs and things like this. So this leads into what I wanted to talk about as far as, um, yeah, so, Anyway, this is a story from Reuters on the 19th. Five killed in Iran during protests over death in custody per a rights group. And uh, security forces opened fire during protests over the death of a woman in police custody. So this has been kind of a big deal in Iran. And it's true that, um, you know, the, the source of this outbreak of protests and things, which there were also protests in 2017 and 2019, or like, th you know, between 2017 and 2019 on this issue. This isn't the first time that this has come up. Um, it's true that there are obviously broader issues facing working class women and the working class generally in Iran. That said, this is a reasonable human rights struggle for communists to be interested in. However, there is this thing, and, and this happened uh, over the Kazakhstan, uh, or was it um, Kyrgyzstan? Uh, back in January, where uh, we did some some things about this. Uh, I think it was Kazakhstan, wasn't it? Anyway, um, where there were protests by workers, it was by like trade unions and things like that, for better paying conditions. And then uh, I think a lot of the companies were, um, I know China has a lot of investments going on in there. And then I believe in the end, the the government called in Russian troops to help quell the protests. And this was met with approval from many Western, you know, quote, anti-imperialists or whatever, because, oh, it was a color revolution. No, so not, every, we've said this before in the last stream, not every uh, human rights struggle is a color revolution. So let's examine for a minute a, a teachable moment coming out of Twitter this past week. So uh, you can see the retweet there is from at Comrade Kim Dawn. And by the way, I'm not trying to dogpile here. This was a bad take and it should be understood, but um, there's still value to that account. Anyway, the tweet was, I think, brain dead. If the CIA supports a global protest, I don't. We see Sal from the Red Army at Chair Lady Spears. This is why it's dangerous to have zero ideology besides USA bad. Sorry to highlight one of your typos, Sal. Um, but it's true, you know, uh, USA diabolism is insufficient 
uh, as far as a source of all your global analysis. So later, and she got, she turned off comments on it, Kim did, and all this stuff, and a lot of people were just like, yeah, don't, don't do this. She came back with seeming to not actually understand what the issue was. Um, she said, I don't understand why my CIA tweet was so controversial. When has the CIA been a force for liberation in the global south? Yeah, that really wasn't the issue, though. Uh, please don't bring up Rojava. It's been used as a pretext for ongoing U.S. occupation of Syria. That's not revolutionary. Well, that's fine. But, um, you know, I replied to it, and, and I think this was polite and also accurate. You know, as for when has the CIA been a force for liberation in the global south, no one thinks that the CIA is a force for, <laughs> force for liberation in the global south. The only people who think that are the, not even all liberals, but just the most clueless liberals. Okay, so don't straw man people criticizing it for that. Or I mean, if that was a sincere misunderstanding, you are misunderstanding it. No one thinks the CIA is a force for liberation in the global south, except for the most clueless liberals, or you know, just overt cynical warmongers. The controversy, why why all the pushback was had, was over the idea that if the CIA supports something, just in order to try to take advantage of that thing, then that thing is inherently bad. That's logically flawed. It's the same logic that reactionaries posing as MLs used to deny Black Lives Matter or LGBTQ plus struggles. In other words, the, the logic goes like this. Some corporations and more socially liberal parts or, you know, that have that mask of the imperialist order recently have tried to do human rights PR for themselves by pretending like they give a shit about LGBTQ plus rights or BLM. Ergo, those things are bad. Well, that's tortured logic, because the reality is imperialists, obviously including the CIA, will use any opportunity that they can, this or that event, or any random Tuesday, to advocate for more imperialism. It's just what they do. Imperialists agitate for imperialism. That's what they do. That's in their class interest, and that's what they do. So you can't denounce human rights struggles just because imperialists are trying to leverage them. Those struggles have nothing to do with them. But people, a lot of times, will like fall into this thing of supporting overt capitalist reaction uh, just because, you know, the, the, the U.S. is trying to leverage some resistance against it. This is, you're honestly a shit communist if, if this is the way you think. You can both support workers' struggles, right? This is foundational to Marxism, while opposing imperialism, also foundational to Marxism. So again, it's it's like with the Russia-Ukraine war situation. A lot of people are falling into this binary thinking where um, we just throw class struggle, we throw workers' rights out the window, we throw human rights out the window in the name of just this kind of... Uh, blind either lesser evilism or just, you know, a non-socialist anti-imperialism. There is no anti-imperialism without socialism. If you are trying to do that, you're fucking up and you're doing lesser evil, lesser evil capitalism. So actually on that note, before we get back to the chat, and I'll probably have to end with this, I can't do any of the longer stuff. Um, but speaking of Ukraine, we had, we had another teachable moment. Um, let's go first with a more uplifting thing. This is from Paulette Sturm. They have a website, also run a YouTube channel. I think they do pretty good work from everything I've seen. They also have a recommended reading list, which we have as a playlist uh, at Socialism for All. Don't forget, you know, don't sleep on that playlists tab. You might be clicking videos or looking at the recent uploads. Check out the playlist as well. Uh, not every playlist is as well maintained. I, I try to give them attention when I can as they could be, but there are some recommended reading lists that are pretty decent, or lists by topic, lists by author, all that kinds of stuff. Um, anyway, this is their, their thing called Mobilization in Russia. It's from three days ago, the 21st, and this is about Putin calling up the reservists. Now, people have been saying about Russia that there's, there's not a draft in Russia, it's just reservists. My understanding, though, and this could be wrong, is that people are automatically reservists if they've previously served in the military. So not all of this may be um, completely voluntary. Uh, so anyway, 
uh, let's get into Politsturm's statement about this. Today, Vladimir Putin announced a partial mobilization in Russia. In the published address, which was supposed to take place last night, the president assessed the undergoing of a special military operation as the, quote, right step. Special military operation also in quotes there. I believe that's what you're required to call it in Russia. I don't, I don't think they're allowed to uh, call it an invasion. It's an invasion. Uh, however, in order to protect the, quote, People's Republics of Donbass, Putin, Putin considered it necessary to support the proposal of the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation to conduct a partial mobilization. One, in accordance with the presidential decree published immediately after the speech, Russian citizens who are in the reserve, who have completed military service, are subject to mobilization. Citizens called up for mobilization will receive the status of those undergoing military service in the armed forces of the Russian Federation under a contract. Citizens of the Russian Federation working in the organization of the military industrial complex receive a deferment for military service. You can also serve it in that way by working uh, in the organization of the military industrial complex. At the same time, Russia is still not entering a state of war, but continues the, quote, special military operation, about which Putin has so far said that only professional military personnel take part in it. Two, this move of the Russian bourgeoisie represents a further escalation of events. Mobilization, about which there were many talks and rumors for more than six months, was nevertheless announced. However, in this decision, the authorities' caution is still visible. Official rhetoric says that, so far, not all citizens of the Russian Federation are subject to mobilization, but only those in the reserve. The government continues to talk about the planned conduct of a special operation, and that these events, like the mobilization, will not affect the majority of the population. Nevertheless, despite the introduction of the term partial mobilization in the first paragraph of the decree signed by Putin, the rest of the decree does not distinguish between mobilization and partial mobilization in any way. Its scope and the number of mobilized will be determined by the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation. The ruling class is afraid of the politicization of the masses. No matter how the authorities realize the need for mobilization measures to change the balance of power in the Ukrainian direction, the ghost of 1917 will always loom before them. Until now, the fear of the armed masses of the people and the relative success in the special military operation have held back big capital from mobilizing. Now, after the quote, regrouping of the Russian armed forces from the Kharkiv region and the increased threat to the position of the DPR and LPR and the general uncertainty of future prospects. The fear of defeat has overcome the fear of the mass arming of the people. The decision to mobilize is forced, undesirable for big capital, which is why it has such a deliberately limited character. The capitalists say that they're trying to keep the involvement of Russians in the conflict to a minimum. According to the Minister of Defense, Sergei Shoigu, it is planned to mobilize up to 300,000 people, less than 1% of the mobile reserve. In rhetoric, emphasis is placed primarily on citizens with combat experience and a military training specialty. Three, despite the circumstances, the tasks of the communists remain the same. So let's consider this, those of us who actually consider ourselves communists and not sort of knee-jerk, contrarian, uh, non-socialist, anti-imperialists. Okay. Quote, uh, point one, exposure of the bourgeoisie and the plans of the imperialists. No arguments here. Next, combating all kinds of opportunism and revisionism and exposing social chauvinism. Next, communist agitation and propaganda, the active introduction of class consciousness into the ranks of workers, the establishment of interaction with labor collectives. Next, the creation of a communist organization, the education and training of activists, the movement towards the formation of a communist party. Now, you're going to say, well, wait a minute, in Russia, don't they have the, like, you know, the official communist party of the Russian Federation? Yeah, they tell Putin. They tell Putin and they're, they're tolerated in the bourgeois government to a huge extent, um, and uh, so you know, what is this worth? It, how radical is it? Is it revolutionary, etc.? There are other communist groups that are more underground, uh, we've covered before and will cover again in Russia, as well as in Ukraine, where all of these left parties have been illegal and they've gone through a period of decommunization, as has Russia as well, which even, you know, if we look at the uh, destruction of the USSR, that was in part, it seems to me, because what was passing for being taught 
as Marxism in the late stages of it, the average people were not, it didn't seem to me, being um, taught, you know, in the revolutionary theoretical tradition that well. If you saw the kind of reasoning people were ending up with, it was very conciliatory towards capitalism, etc. So it's not just the past 30 years that you have to contend, contend with. Of course, there are people who lived during the official, you know, during the era of the USSR. But what is their actual understanding of Marxism at this point, given that they were being teached by, a, a, or taught, teached, nice, <laughs> who's, who, who teached me English? Anyway, given that they've been taught by a USSR that was headed for, you know, in, in revisionism and headed for destruction. So it's more like closer to at least going back 40 years, etc. cetera. Uh, not to say that there aren't uh, actual, you know, knowledgeable Marxists, but what I'm trying to say is don't overestimate it there. But anyway, yeah, this is absolutely the case. We're trying to do this here in the United States. We're trying to do this. This channel is accessible to whoever can get on YouTube and uh, can, can deal with English, which is about 1.3 billion people across, across the world do speak English. So, you know, we're putting this material out there. Uh, yeah, creation of a communist organization, education and training of activists. Obviously, the training that is probably more of a grassroots IRL kind of thing. But uh, exposure of the bourgeoisie, plans of the imperialists. So caping for Russia, caping for capitalist Russia of like, oh, they're defending themselves. No, they weren't attacked. <laughs> they weren't attacked. They invaded another country. So this this is uh, counter to exposure of the bourgeoisie and the plans of the imperialists. And, you know, I've seen other people like, oh, well, sure, capitalist profits come into it, but they're out for, you know, national security. You know, here's the thing, though. National security and capitalist profits, as we know in, in capitalist states, these, these are basically the same thing. They at least overlap to an enormous degree. Uh, yeah, that, that's really what we're talking about here. Actually, the same person told me capital, uh, not everything you don't like is capitalism. Yes, in fact. Yes, the history of human society is the history of class struggle. We're in capitalism right now, and that's what's driving the countries who are making these decisions. That's what's driving them. All right. However, the moment escalates and the severity of the conflict increases. Therefore, one, preserving and improving the former communist organizational, informational, and educational work is necessary to refrain from carrying out ill-conceived actions and antics, so against adventurism, at the same time exposing all communists, socialists, and other leftists who call for such adventures. It's a quote from Lenin in Collapse of the Second International. The conflagration is spreading. By the way, this is a text from the Basic Marxism-Leninism Study Guide. It's a major uh, text uh, from Lenin. This pertained to the build-up to world, well, and the start of World War I. The conflagration is spreading. The suffering of the masses are appalling. The efforts of governments, the bourgeoisie, and the opportunists to hush up these sufferings, proving ever more futile. Sounds familiar. The war profits being obtained by certain groups of capitalists are monstrously high. I mean, literally, like most of the U.S. economy is a war economy held together by this, this exactly this kind of thing. So, yeah. Uh, and contradictions are growing extremely acute. The smoldering indignation of the masses, the vague yearning of society's downtrodden and ignorant strata for a kindly, quote, democratic peace, the beginning of discontent among the lower classes, all these are facts. The longer the war drags on and the more acute it becomes, the more the governments themselves foster, and must foster, the activity of the masses whom they call upon to make extraordinary effort and self-sacrifice. End quote. Obviously, make effort and self-sacrifice in the name of capitalism, and the masses' material interests and capitalist material interests are diametrically opposed. What's good for capitalists is bad for workers. What's good for workers is bad for capitalists. Uh, so... You know, they're calling on workers to violate our own class interests there. So I just want to highlight something before we move on to the next and final piece. The um, vague yearning for a kindly democratic peace. This is a, you know, kind of like petty bourgeois or, or lower pacifism. Uh, it's not going to get resolved this way. This, this is the point Lenin's trying to make. Um, and the beginnings of discontent. Um, you know, the way that you actually end a war like this you know, if it had if it had not been for the October Revolution in 1917, Russia's involvement in World War One may have continued. There was, in fact, um, the Kornilov Revolt in the summer, which was intended to put Russia under martial law and extend Russia's involvement in the war, which was 
becoming it was coming increasingly into question at that point because workers were uh, refusing to fight <clears throat> and other things, you know, largely at the uh, direction and encouragement of the Bolsheviks who you know saw this and helped to foster that activity. This, this is what you do. You know, the position is revolutionary defeat of one's own government in the war. This is, uh, I mean, ultimately, you want to see the defeat of all the bourgeois governments. You want to see them all get unstable and then collapse due to proletarian revolution. It's not uh, pro uh, uh, the defeat of your own government and the victory of someone else's. It's also not the victory of your own bourgeois government, you know, your own in quotes, and then the, the, the defeat of someone else's. The idea here is that uh, the imperialists make themselves vulnerable. They go out on this limb. This is why Paul Sturm is talking about the capitalist class has feared an armed and angry public. It's why they've, uh, you know, tried not to institute this draft or, you know, calling up of reserves at this point because it, it puts them in a vulnerable spot. So they've been reluctant to do it and they've tried to keep it to a minimum and they're trying to downplay it in language you know, every which way that they can, because this is taking a risk for them. They understand this. It's why the U.S. also is, you know, proud to have a um, an all-volunteer army, which, of course, I mean, a lot of the reason that people joined the armed forces in the United States is because of the economic draft. In other words, to get health care, to get college paid for, stuff like that, which, of course, wouldn't be needed if we had universal health care, free college, and so on and so on. Uh, we'll be able to, I'll, I'll have a follow-up for that um, right after this. But anyway, so this is a risk, um, the, the bourgeoisie of Russia. You're, you're not doing socialism any favors by um, repeating bourgeois Russian propaganda, just as you don't do any favors for repeating bourgeois U.S. or NATO propaganda. This isn't our interest as communists. Our interest is in uh, people's desire for peace. This isn't in workers' interests, in other words and in creating the collapse of the bourgeois government to pave the way. And obviously there's a lot of organizing involved in this, which we have to do, and agitation and education leading up to the organizing and alongside it. But, uh, you know, that, that, that's what it takes for a, pro, for a proletarian revolution, which is what we're after uh, if you're actually a real communist, yeah. Closing it out, the events taking place in the world are increasingly reminiscent of the situation of a hundred years ago, World War I. Lenin's words vividly illustrate the current situation. The actions of the bourgeois authorities will cause a reaction among the broad masses of the population and thereby destroy the very illusions about stability that have been imposed by the same government for decades. Because remember, Russia in the 90s was very chaotic like the mafia ruled a lot of stuff. You went literally overnight from a situation where the government handled all the distribution to where people, there was literally no way to just distribute goods. People were setting up card tables in the streets with like basic items on them for people to get stuff as like kind of a extraordinarily half-assed sort of flea market of stuff. Uh, then the mafia took over for a while, eventually out of this and partly with the assistment, uh, assistance and advising by the U.S., uh, you know, Putin, uh, going into the 2000s, started making Russia into what it is today. So it's been, quote, stable for a very brief period of time. Don't forget that. You know, anyway, however, the working people themselves, no matter how wide the strip of disasters, will not be able to realize their interests and lead the struggle for socialism. The duty is entrusted to the communist vanguard. Let's pause right here. A lot of people wrongly consider the idea of the vanguard elitist. What is the vanguard? The vanguard is the most class conscious portion of the working class. All right. It's the most studied. It's the most experienced and therefore the most class conscious. So this is a relative term, obviously. No matter what, unless you think the entire working class is the same level of class consciousness, which is just wrong, then there is a vanguard. Just there is there is more and there is less class consciousness. Um, so the idea is that the working people are going to be upset with this, but they won't really know what to do. It's up to the most class conscious workers to point the way. This is a responsibility to teach. All right. That's what it's about. That's, that's what the Vanguard is about is if you know this stuff, it's your duty to teach it, to try to give advice and leadership, agitate, educate, and help 
the people to organize. Ultimately, this is a movement of the working class, but that political education where people even realize what they need to do to take their power back from capitalists is, uh, well, take it back, to just take the power from capitalists. Uh, you could say back because it's our goods and services that we created, our labor that produced all their wealth. However you want to phrase that, um, you know, it's the vanguard's job, the most class conscious people. It's our job to speak up. That's the point. A sober assessment of the situation from scientific Marxist-Leninist positions, firm restraint, and the establishment of communist work. These are the requirements of the current movement. What is meant by communist work? This is the agitation, education, and organizing. We call on conscious workers and communists to join this work in the ranks of the Politsturm. Write us at politsturm.inter, I-N-T-E-R, at gmail.com. So yeah, that's what Politsturm is doing over there. Like I said, from what I've seen, pretty good stuff. Before we go back to the chat and close out this stream number 47 for today, uh, let us just point to uh, first a teachable moment and then a little bit uh, about here. I just thought this was interesting. So some of you might know Esha um, from Late Nights with Lenin. And uh, she had a tweet before about, oh, if you want to defeat fascism in Ukraine. And I replied to this, you know, again, politely, but firmly. Sorry, do you think that Russia is out to, quote, defeat fascism in Ukraine rather than protecting and expanding Russian capitalist interests? That was what I asked. She didn't reply. She, quote, tweeted, which is usually a hostile action. But anyway, um, it does not matter what I think because she's trying to make a shine of grandstand on it. And, you know, fair enough. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll do that as well. But with the understanding that I'm probably um, not going to be the best of friends with the person afterwards necessarily. So, you know, it is what it is. Here she is on the stream. Uh, it does not matter what I think. The evidence is more important, for example, in the areas of Lugansk, etc. So examples of violence coming out of the fog of war that is going on in Ukraine. And I just happen to notice Twitter tells you where people are tweeting from. <laughs> she's, having a nose. she's literally in St. Petersburg. I thought she was American, but um, and I think she is. But anyway, I just thought that was so, somewhat of an ironic sort of thing there. Like, oh, you just happen to be tweeting the pro-Russia position from literally inside Russia. Now, I don't know if that was a um, if you can somehow my understanding of the Twitter location is you you can set your neighborhood within the location, but you can't just put like a flat out false location. You can in your bio. People put comical things in their bio all the time. But in that, I don't think that you can. So anyway, curious that you'd be taking the pro russia position from inside Russia. So in that case, um, you know, even even th then at that point, the defeat of one's own government in the bourgeois war, uh, people can say, oh, shut up. Just just talk about the U.S. Well, she's literally in fucking Russia. So whatever. Uh, one other thing that I, I did want to get in here before we move on from this general subject. Um, talking about the economic draft, this is from the Council on Foreign Relations, obviously very high level, you know, imperialist uh, think tank, but th the data is, are usually accurate uh, if the analysis is, is not exactly proletarian. How affluent are enlisted recruits? Most members of the military come from middle class neighborhoods. So this is from recent years. And my question was, um, when they got rid of the draft decades ago, I don't know if this was always the case, but anyway, most members of the military come from middle class neighborhoods, the middle three quintiles for household income, quintile is dividing things into fifths. Uh, so the middle three uh, brackets out of five for household income were overrepresented among enlisted recruits and the top and bottom quintiles were underrepresented. Well, no great um, surprise that the top quintile, that the 1% and the 10% or, you know, whatever, I guess it would be the, the top 20% were underrepresented. Um, probably only extraordinarily staunch conservatives are going to be uh, joining up there, but uh, that it's middle class. So my um, thought on this is, is it that now in the late 20 teens and 20 early 2020s, that this is intergenerational and that these people are coming from military families. And, you know, keep in mind, I mean, middle income brackets, we're talking about down to 41, 41, seven here. It's not exactly uh, rich. Um, I mean, you can struggle quite a bit making that amount of money. So, um, but it's, it's not just the, the poorest. In fact, the under 41,000 is underrepresented. So interesting stuff. I'd be curious to see how this changed over time and how social policy has affected this. 
in any case, it's it's interesting to know who is actually making up uh, the U.S. Um, armed forces sociologically on a class basis, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, but uh, a much broader topic for another day. Got about 10 minutes left before I really have to go here. So let's check in with the chat. Again, I'm going to skip ahead past um, the lingering COVID comments and just, you know, get to more of this stuff and see, see what else we've got. You know, I'll, I'll save the, uh, the, the COVID comments, though, um, for later if I can here. So somebody says about the military junta in China. Again, I've not even heard about this at all. I'm anxious because of the news because military juntas tend to want to fight wars to justify their control. Somebody else asks, um, does this mean that they're going to be joining in with Russia or what does it mean as far as the, the war is concerned? COVID is going to make idiocracy real. Turns out it wasn't genetics that made the U.S. turn stupid. It was COVID. I mean, it's not helping, like, for sure. And I don't mean to, like, comically downplay it because there's nothing funny about brain damage. But, um, no, th this is not going to help anything. We know life expectancy is going down. If literally people's intelligence is going down, we had enough problems as it is. And I, I sincerely mean that. It's not going to improve anybody's ability to analyze their... Um, their social conditions, that's for sure. All right, where are we now? A lot of good COVID stuff here um, that I will I will come back to later. Oh, so people are saying in the China thing is articles from Indian tabloids. Well, we'll see. No, I think I confused it with Kyrgyzstan. I've been reading a lot of um, articles about Chinese capitalism in Kyrgyzstan, and that's, that's why. Yeah, a color revolution is not just CIA supporting it. Well, tell it to these people. It means sending provocateurs into the mix to ramp up chaos and violence, then derailing any kind of liberatory direction of the protests. Yeah, but a lot of people, like, at the first sign of an uprising will be like, color revolution, CIA did it. And I've seen two, there, some of the dialogue on that is like, you know, U.S. leftists try to not make this about the U.S. constantly. Now, to be fair, the CIA, I mean, you, the U.S. is all over the world. The, the USA <clears throat> has inserted itself. There's military, hundreds of military bases around the world from the U.S. So it's not unreasonable to think that the U.S. is all over the world. It is. And it's doing things. At the same time, like, it, it gets extremely... Um, it's just a horrible starting point <clears throat> for your analysis of um, any kind of uh, uprising. There could be like a sincere communist uprising tomorrow in like, you know, France, some other like, you know, imperialist country. And it would be like immediately you'd have at least half of the uh, U.S. left being like, color revolution. It's just, yeah, people have to just chill on that stuff. This is another way that the right wing derails um you know, socialist perspectives. The decree Putin signed actually has none of the supposed limits people keep talking about. In Russian, it just says that mobilization is now happening. All right. That's why in our days, bourgeoisie prefers professional military. Armed proletariat is dangerous for them. Yeah, I mean, we covered this in a recent um, audio book. I forget which one it is. Was it the revolutionary task of the proletariat in the revolution? Um, or the task of the revolutionary proletariat? Anyway, uh, it was one of the recent ones where Lenin is outlining the need for, for that. Because Lenin had started to note the rise of what we would today call the military industrial complex which capitalism was just getting sophisticated enough in the 19 teens and so to um, to start forming that. Prior to that, it wasn't as organized, it wasn't as consolidated. There's also like um, Smedley Butler, 
frequently cited by kind of like FDR liberals and stuff in the U.S., wrote a thing called War is a Racket. It's, um, I have it on the channel as an audiobook because a lot of people refer to it. But it's basically the same thing, is that war is big business. Yes, it's there to fight for, um, for the expansion of capitalism. You know, it's, um, there was that book from the 2000s, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. I forget the guy's name. Uh, like former CIA guy that, you know, it's his memoirs of like going around being a gangster for capitalism. And I think that I think that's from a Smedley Butler quote, actually. I was a gangster for capitalism. It could be confusing with somebody else. But yeah, that's the idea. But the, the military industrial complex as we know it, that, you know, like Eisenhower gave that speech about and all that kind of stuff that you're sort of, you know, JFK liberals in the United States will sort of refer to a lot. And they're not wrong, but there's, there's a lot more um, work that they have to do politically in their education beyond just being a JFK liberal. Um, that's not really going to cut it for um, remedying the problems that you're talking about. You're right about pointing out the military industrial complex as a problem. You have the standing interest, uh, but you need to understand it goes beyond just the independent interests of the military contractors and all these people who, yes, have formed conglomerates, which have enormous influence in the government. But the reason that they're, they're there and so close to the government is because capitalism need, there's no version of capitalism that can operate at this level that capitalism is on without those things. It needs that level of coordinated violence worldwide to sustain empire. So that's that's where it's coming from. You uh, cannot be capitalist and support the dismantling of the military industrial complex. It's literally the basis of the US economy and transitioning out of this would require a planned, cooperative, peaceful, socialist transition into something else if you didn't want to see like, you know, just complete global economic chaos. We need to agitate, educate, and organize tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people to get to that point where we would be able to oversee and, you know, facilitate and negotiate that kind of a transition away from the imperialism-centered economy of today to something that would be really fundamentally different in character and wouldn't wind up just doing the same thing in a different form. The U.S. has ex essentially exported its brain rot to the globe via the hegemonic dollar. I see the collapse of the dollar as the reserve currency is one of the keystones required for the shrinking back of the U.S. empire, which exerts global pressure, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, the thing is, understand the other countries that would be making this, you know, competing reserve currency, which there has been talk of for a long time. People say it's like why Saddam Hussein got taken out. He was going to stop you're know, doing oil and dollars and all this kind of stuff. Um, these are other capitalists. And the point of why we're doing all of this education and agitation and calling for organization from a communist Marxist Leninist standpoint is we're not just doing capitalist lesser evilism because that in itself really only gets you so far. It's what the capitalists are going to do anyway. We're not capitalists. I am not in the 1%. That's, that's not something that I am tasked with or interested in. That's not my class interest. It's not my historical position, etc. cetera. Uh, what we do is try to build a movement for communism, a Marxist-Leninist movement. And so that's what we're interested in. And we got to drop the lesser evilism is the point um, and focus on that. Because the point is, if we were strong enough, you wouldn't even have to wait for the whole reserve currency competition movement. We could do it now. Um, yes, it's true that the existing strength of the U.S. impedes our ability to agitate, educate, and organize. It means it'll go more slowly and so on. But with more people doing it, it will go faster again. So this is the thing that we primarily need to focus on. And what I'm saying is the balance here is way off. All the people reading social media and sort of, you know, um, excitedly stimulating themselves to news of like, oh yeah, there's another competitor for hegemony and whatever. If it's not socialist, your task is not done. Put the fucking social media down and go do something about this. The, the center needs to be on communist, Marxist, Leninist education. Everything else is secondary to that because again, you wouldn't need to wait for World War III to weaken them if we were strong enough. And then if, you know, 
Despite our best efforts, we're not strong enough to head off World War III. If you even want to take proper advantage of that from a communist perspective for the proletariat, you have to be as organized as you possibly can. And if you're wasting your time getting all hyped up about this other stuff, intercapitalist competition, you're missing out on what you need to be doing, your task as a class conscious proletarian. So, you know, the balance needs to shift back there. Um, Infracell at Al, the other Pat Sox, LaRoucheites, were calling color revolution before anything happened in Kazakhstan when Putin put down the protests. Yeah, um, yeah, I remember that. And, uh, you know, this was obviously a prelude to the invasion of Ukraine. And, uh, you know, it certainly, we went through a lot of um, turbulence at S4A with people uh, who were non-socialist anti-imperialists anti-imperialist in quotes there, uh, having a hard time with uh, more of a communist representation there. Turn inter-imperialist war into class war. Yes, and it's a great slogan and it's accurate. The amount of agitation education organized required for that is massive. We're trying to contribute what we can here at this channel. It's going to go far beyond that. It really needs the involvement of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people. We need to be mobilizing people in the U.S. by the tens of millions for this. So that's where, uh, you know, here's where we are. Here's where we need to get to. Yes, P100s are reusable, um, especially if you get the elastomeric kind. They're reusable for months. All right, we're going to leave it there. Um, you can VPN any location, I believe. Uh, interesting, though, that you would... <laughs> VPN a location that is more restrictive than the U.S. if you were in the U.S. Why would you do that? I don't see. Anyway, um, we're going to leave it there. Yeah, and it is what it is. I just thought that was a somewhat lighter, on a lighter, you know, comically ironic, like just happened to be tweeting the Russian bourgeoisie's position from literally fucking Russia. Anyway, um, the scale of what we need to accomplish is very large. I agree with you. Yeah, that, and this is why I'm saying it's not that it's not doable, but it won't be doable if we don't do all the work that we can on an ongoing basis. Obviously, you got to rest here and there, but um, it's this has got to be a continuous project, pulling in more and more people uh, into it, and then you know hashing out the differences. Just as you know, we can see in the in the writings of Lenin was going on constantly within the RSDLP. Um, you've got to actually correct the mistakes uh, before they turn into uh, derailings of the movement. All right. Thanks again, everybody. We're going to sign out. I really appreciate everybody. we got 40 people in the chat. As we're ending this, I appreciate everybody showing up, or if you're listening to this on YouTube afterwards. Um, it's been a great stream. We're going to take a few days off. There will be an audiobook posted uh, before this of Lenin, Disruption of Unity Under Cries. Uh, under cover of outcries for unity that's recorded it'll go up on the channel then this will be posted and then i will see you again next week take care everybody